Well, what an incredibly beautiful film. It's an absolute joy for us to welcome Mr. Mike Lee, uh, one of our great directors of stage and screen. I'm sure we're all more than familiar with his work, including Abigail's Party, Life is Sweet, Topsy Turvy, Secrets and Lies, and the amazing Vera Drake. We're also really pleased to be joined by esteemed radio and television presenter, reporter, and novelist Francine Stock, who currently presents the film program on Radio 4 and has engaged extensively with Mike Lee's work over the years. We're delighted to welcome you both. Please join us in thanking Mike and Francine for joining us this evening. Samir. And, um, well, I can see from your expressions that um, you were as rapt as I was um, when I saw the film. Mike, just before I open it up to, to questions from the audience, just a couple of the sort of fairly basic things, which is the decision to concentrate on the latter years. Was that because you felt it was a distillation of his style and his work, or because you felt that somehow it would be easier to show the kind of the biographical development in that state? Um, I think uh, it, it is easier to... I felt when we could distill everything that we would want to say about him into that last quarter century. It's a very interesting part of his life, of course. It starts with the death of his father, which is very important. You then get the relationship with Mrs Booth, a whole lot of particular incidents and events like uh, seeing the fighting Tamara and the famous um, red blob uh, <laughs> uh, incident in the Royal Academy, which of course actually happened. Um, but most importantly, it was in that late period, which of course you can see next door in the flesh, for real, um, it, it, that he became radical, ah. really uh, pushed the boat out. Uh, and revolutionised painting and anticipated Impressionism in the 20th century. Um, apart from that, I, I mean, I suppose we could have made a, a, a biopic starting with his birth. Um, you would have had to find a small fat boy that looked like <laughs> Timothy Spall who could draw and paint, which would be <laughs> tedious to say the least, and maybe a, pimp, a pimply teenager as well. But I think we would have to trawl through a whole lot of things which the, of which the important ones I felt I was able to quietly put into the narrative as it went. So that you, if you were paying attention, you got that his mother was mad and um, that obviously his mother and her lunacy brought him and his father together. You got that he had um, a sister who died in infancy, you got that he went to school in Margate and it was quite traumatic and so on and so forth. And the, the fact that uh, Timothy Swall, we gather, actually learnt to paint a bit of a minute, how important, because that could have been fun, just, you know, you didn't have to do that. But well, I think we did have to do it, actually, um, because uh, there are two important things about that. One is that, you know, otherwise you'd have to do that thing of having a close-up of his face and a close-up of somebody else's hand, and, uh, which is kind of crude. But over and above the, the mere technical uh, awf awfulness of that, or, you know, the bad taste that it would be, this is a film about a guy who does it, you know, who does, gets down to the, the down-and-dirty business of making paintings. He was very physical with it. He was very visceral with it. You needed to see that happening. You needed to see his industrial process. You needed to actually experience that for real. And so Tim applied himself to not to becoming Turner, obviously, but to knowing how to use the, um, the, te the technology. And for you, I mean, you, you had studied art um, before you went in, into the filmmaking and um, you knew about Turner, but, but for you, what were the great revelations as you began to find out more? It's not something I can quantify. Um, 
making, I mean, for me anyway, and this is partly to do with the way I make films, but it, it's uh, making a film as a journey of adventure and discovery. You find out what the film is by the process of making it, which is in fact how, as we know, you make paintings and novels are written and so forth. Um, so I, and indeed everybody involved with the film, um, did an immense amount of research, incidentally, with great help and encouragement from in this very building, where the doors were open to us with great generosity, and everybody from both sides of the camera was able to use the research facility upstairs. Um, and it, so it's hard to say what in particular. It just was an enormous journey of discovery and immersion. And, you know, you, we were saying just now when we were talking outside... Um, you can, I, 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 I've been saying, you, you can, in a few minutes, recite a list of all of Shakespeare's plays. There are only 32 of them. Um, you cannot, I mean, maybe somebody can, but to enlist all of Turner's work and to recite it in alphabetical order would be absolutely impossible because there is so much of it. And it's not just the quantity, but it's the diversity and getting our head around all of that and trying in some way to, to distill it was, was a tough one, and I don't know that we have, really. Um, so it, it just was, was, and indeed continues to be, an endless <laughs> continue, you know, um, round of revelations, really. So th the area that you must have worked on um, most intently, um, particularly in, in your specific way of preparing for films was the dynamics of these close personal relationships mm. that were clearly so important to him and his work, so specifically with his father and then later in this wonderful domestic kind of idyll, really. So that is... That yes, is and also his, with his housekeeper yeah. uh, um, and indeed his f uh, first partner, although you don't see much of her in the film, <laughs> we still have to deal with that relationship. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but those, and that is, take, that is from... What you have written that is well imagined, I mean, or well, it starts with the research. It starts with um, abs rigorously finding out everything you can. I mean, there are biographies, there are descriptions um, from people at the time, and so on and so forth. Um, it's quite, it's quite. Some of it's quite pretty enigmatic. I mean, I you know Google uh, Google images. J.M.W. Turner, and you'll come up with all the images of him there are, and very few of them look like each other. And the one that looks least like him is his famous self-portrait that he painted when, when, when he was a young man. Um, but it's detective work, and it's building up a picture, but it's certainly, in terms of the, those central characters, it's very much starting from everything we could glean, which in some cases, like Mrs. Booth, like Hannah Damage's housekeeper, is not very much really... And then really just um, in an informed and hopefully responsible way, but still creatively and inventively, bringing, putting flesh uh, uh, on those bones and bringing those characters to life. Uh, and being um, inventive in a, as I say, a hopefully responsible way. For example, we know that Hannah Danby, his housekeeper, was with him for over 40 years. We know that... People endlessly describe going to the house or to visit his gallery, which was attached to the house, and being let in by this strange woman with a skin disease of some kind. Um, but the sexual relationship between Turner and Hannah, we invented. But it felt very proper, and it felt somehow inevitable in terms of the relationship that we were creating. Now, um, time for some, the, some questions, if you have them. We have a couple of microphones. When you uh, actually get to this microphone, if you can speak directly into it, there's a hand down the front here um, for the first one. If there's anybody else thinking they might want to, we'll get the second microphone to you. Great, thanks. First off, oh, yep, yep. First off can I just say, Timothy Spale was just amazing as Turner. And it, and, 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 and it just blew me away, blew me away completely. I was just wondering, when you, research, when you and, and Tim researched the role yourself, as you do as an artist yourself, did you find yourself having an affiliation with Turner? Because you know, in, 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 you've made the film yourself, of course you <coughs> have to make the film. But did you have sort of, say, if you hypothetically speaking met him, you'd have had a sort of, you'd feel you'd have met some sort of kindred spirit? It's an interesting question. 
would I get on with, would we get on with Turner? My, I think so, probably. Uh, I think he was, for all his um, apparent uh, eccentricity and curmudgeonliness, I, I think he was pretty open-minded sort of guy. I mean, the, the truth of it is, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room that can say this, over the years, one has known the likes of Turner. You know, um, I mean, we all know a Turner, that's to say, and bohemian or artistic or uh, contrary or uh, contradictory um, chap or woman. <laughs> and so we know these guys, and I think, yes, probably. And I think he, uh, one of the questions that we, uh, from time to time, asked ourselves, not least because we shot this film on a digital camera, which was a big breakthrough for us. Uh, we've pre uh, up to now shot Dick Pope and I, my cinematographer, have made all our films on film, of course. Um, and from time to time we would say, what would Turner think? <laughs> you know? And of course, the fact is, he would be up for it. He was fascinated by new things. The, the, the um, uh, lead, metal paint tube, squeezable tube, came into existence right in the middle of the action of this film, and I, at one point, uh, intended to include it, but then I realised it, it would be a fiddly thing to dramatise within the overall context of things. But he was... Uh, other artists were very resistant. They wanted to stick to uh, sheep's and pigs' bladders, but he, uh, he was first in there, you know. He, he was up for technology. So, but... Uh, I think he'd be quite a companionable sort of chap, really. I don't know. I may be wrong. <laughs> and if he's listening, which he probably is in this building, <laughs> then <laughs> perhaps he'll communicate the answer later. I don't know. Thanks for coming. And thanks for tonight, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Another question. Next question. Oh, oh sorry. Can we straight back? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a great film, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about the characters, because they really came to life, and wonderful acting. Um, how much freedom did they have? Did, were they ad-libbing? Were you giving them a, you know, script or...? <laughs> well, we made the film in the same way that I have made all of my films, including, incidentally, Topsy Turvy, which was also a period film, as was Vera Drake. Um, and... and there's no ad-libbing, as you say, no improvising going on, on in front of the camera. It all comes out of improvisation work and exploration, but you gradually pin it down and script it. Of course, apart from anything else, uh, we had to be very rigorous about the period language, and we've been very careful about that. So there's no question of um, just showing up and ad-libbing period language. I mean, they, they, the actors are good at that and they were, you know, um, very good at going so far with it. But in the end, we have to, you have to take it and pin it down and organise it and script it. And, and, you know, I do believe in very well-written scripts and I hope this is such a thing, really. I think the casting was really good in terms of, you know, how they looked and... Uh, well, thanks. Just, so I, I hope so. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. May I say again, I, like everyone else here, I think I really enjoyed it. But I'm fascinated by your choice of ending. Um, uh, biopics inevitably uh, feel the need, I think, at the end to kind of have a real sense of closure quite often and sort of summing up. Whereas I felt that you ended with a real kind of open-ended enigma. I wanted to know more about the other characters in his life at that particular point and ending with Hannah of the choice of the two women so you've got a positive you know smile as she's cleaning the window for Mrs Booth is that correct and then Hannah the, you know this real kind of poignancy why that way round rather than the other way round or why well, indeed have that why, why not just end all? with him well uh, um, uh, 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 of course it isn't a biopic uh, um, uh, and Specifically, um, uh, I, I absolutely don't do what biopics traditionally do, which is to explain everything all the time and point you in directions and make everything comfortable and clear and all of that. Um, I, I even chose 
uh, very deliberately not to have labels all over the film saying when it was and when, it, because so that we could fluidly go from through uh, 25 years or so without you, uh, with, with, you know, so that you, it would happen and you didn't especially notice it except you were aware that it was happening. As far as the end is concerned, the decision to end it where we do is, in the first place, comes from the fact that uh, when Turner died, he left specific instructions for Hannah Danby to be left in the house as it was, untouched, with all his stuff there, until she died. It so happens that she died two years later. And so the image that once... And having discovered that, the image that that gives you is really what how the film ends. Um, and to, to, to put um, Sophia Booth first, the as you call it, the positive, the, the, the warm, it just seems logical. And I do like, in certainly my films, to give you something to go away with, to reflect on, to ponder, to take with you, and so on and so forth. It's slightly eccentric to say that in the context of this film, because you can go away and read about what happened next, um, and all sorts of things did. I mean, one of the things that I could have ended the film with, but I felt it wasn't really in the core spirit of what the film was about, is the fact that Ruskin um, became Turner's executor and um, sorted out all his stuff, and, as you may know, is said to, although some academics now dispute it, is said to have destroyed a lot of what he saw as Turner's pornographic uh, drawings. In fact, they are not that at all. They're um, very fine erotic drawings, some of which I think the Tate publishes in a small book. Um, but to end the film there would have been, I think, um, reductionist, really. And since what I'm concerned with is the real um, universal currency of the man's life uh, and see, his relationships allow us to look at that in an emotional way it seemed the logical way to end what, sh what must I felt be an inconclusive film to hand over to you Okay. Is that working? I'm not sure. Yeah, oh yeah. I found the film so inspirational, Mike, in every way. Thank you so much. Okay. Was it, how did you decide to portray his relationship with John I'm Ruskin? sorry, but I can't hear you. I do apologise. Ah. Um, you found it inspirational, so how did you decide to portray Yeah, how did you decide to portray the relationship with John Ruskin and... What, would, what was Turner's real feelings towards Ruskin? Do we know okay. his, his true feelings? Well, um, a number of things led us to um, characterise Ruskin the way, the way we do. Um, in the first place, he was uh, spoilt terribly by these parents, the, the cosseted... I mean, his mother, when he went to Oxford, his mother went and took rooms next to his rooms. My theory is so that she would carry on breastfeeding him. <laughs> um, I mean, he was a terrible, terrible prig. And, uh, of course, what a mu quite a lot of what he says in the film, and he doesn't appear that much, actually is drawn from Ruskin. Um, he is always present... Uh, dramatised, because he's actually been done on a, quite a number of occasions, including in a current other feature film that's kicking around at the moment, as rather dour and all of that. Well, we know that he had um, problems of a sexual nature, or at least so it would appear. Um, and we just felt that there was another way of interpreting this guy, particularly um, in his young, precocious uh, stage, but also uh, we just thought, I thought, it would be a wheeze to break the mould and to present Ruskin as something of a, a plausible, if comic, character. And also served by a brilliant actor, Joshua Maguire, who I, I think is uh, 
to be watched. <laughs> <laughs> the scene of the storm, um, was, that, um, was, that, was that documented? No. Um, it, it, what is documented is that Turner was a great fan of uh, Purcell, of Dido and Aeneas, and he was also quite preoccupied with the Aeneas myth and all of that. Um, so all of that was going on in, the, uh, in our awareness of the character and so forth. But the actual event in the film where he sings that actually came out quite spontaneously when we were rehearsing and improvising and exploring uh, the relationships and the, the possible scenes actually at Petworth House where we, we, uh, we shot the sequence. I, want, I wanted to ask you a quick question about the locations, if I may. Um, so when it was set in Margate, was it filmed in Margate? Cause Absolutely not, and anybody... <laughs> <laughs> any, anybody, anybody... Put your hand up if you know Margate. Absolutely. I don't know Margate. Um, so um, the, all of the people who just put their hand up will tell you that it bore no resemblance to Margate. <laughs> um, and um, they're very polite in not having mentioned it so far, if I'm afraid. All of them. Um, <laughs> uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't film in Margate. Uh, we couldn't get the control of Margate and, ca and be able to do all those things. It's, it's a busy place and it's much changed. And apart from anything else... Sorry? Could I ask where it was? Yes. Filmed? Yes, it was filmed um, just west of Plymouth at a place called King Sand. Um, and the light there was fantastic. And that was as important to us as the very specific architecture of, uh, uh, of Margate. So we felt we got the spirit of a seaside place, but it doesn't really uh, resemble M Margate. But you, you did film at Petworth House, then? Oh, yeah, Petworth House is yeah. Petworth House, for real. And the only real Turner paintings that you see in the film are those ones that are set in the carved, um, the carved room uh, at Petworth, which... Um, was a joy to shoot in, I have to say. Mm. Any more? Yes. And then here. So if you get the other microphone down to there as well. Thanks. Um, I don't know very much about filmmaking, but one's given to understand that directors generally shoot a load of stuff and chuck it away. And I'm wondering whether the way you create your films, and obviously, you know, you're planning and creating it as it goes along, do you end up chucking a load of stuff away, or does the whole thing come perfectly formed? Well, I mean, it hopefully comes to you perfectly formed <laughs> at the end of the process. Um, uh, 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 films are, it, it is a non-negotiable fact that films are made in the cutting room. And what you do when you shoot it is to shoot raw material and, uh, and take it to the cutting room. Um, the question then, which is really what you're asking, is, to what, is how organised what you shoot is or how wild it is. And on the whole, the way that I make films, it's pretty organised and pretty much, uh, not very much in this film, wound up on the cutting room floor, as they say. Um, pretty much, really just a couple of bits here and there, but it's pretty much what we filmed um, in a properly distilled and organised form. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask what started you on the project? What was the, what was the inspiration? What well, was the cue? In the first place, um, a love of, uh, of Turner, really. Um, and many a visit here and elsewhere, um, I discovered Turner really in any meaningful way when I was um, a student at Camberwell Art School in the early 60s. <coughs> um, and it just occurred to me after we made the film Topsy Turvy about the Victorian theatre, Gilbert and Sullivan, <coughs> um, in the late 90s that there might be a film in Turner. Um, whose work is nothing if not cinematic. And once I started to look at, read about and 
research turn of the personality, it just seemed a really proper thing to pursue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we're just about out of time, but if there's, there's probably time for one more. Or I mean, given Turner's love of um, innovation and the sort of development of the, the technology development, what do you think he would have liked about now or not? <laughs> I'm tempted to say, well, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think? well, yeah, no, I wonder. Do you think, do you think he would have liked... Do you think he would have liked the way that his images could be disseminated in all sorts of... Well, yeah, I think he would. And in yeah. fact, uh, one of the things that I, I pondered for a, 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 um, hard and long, but decided not to include in the film, is a whole other side of his life, which was his relationship with the engravers. Because obviously this was before the age of um, photo reproduction. And his work was very, very popular. Because don't forget, I mean, we take it for granted that, you know, oh, you say Turner, everybody every, in the world can look at the images. But don't forget, the only people that saw the work was anybody that was physically there. And the important thing about the scene in the film, which, actually, which is based on an actual uh, uh, real event, where the millionaire offers him 100,000 quid uh, for the entire oeuvre, and he says, no, it has to be, it goes to the nation, to be looked at together, gratis. Uh, that is the turn of bequest that is here, uh, although it took them from his death in 1851 until 1947, apparently, to sort it all out. But that's an, another matter. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so the people, the public, couldn't see the work because it was all in private collections. There were no public collections. The only public collection in the world uh, before the National Gallery was the Louvre in Paris. And so, you know, all people, ordinary people and people around and about and, out and around the country and elsewhere could, wouldn't know or see Turner by any means other than reproduction. And the reproductions were engravings which had to be, of course, copied by engravers who were very good at copying the work. And he had quite fractious relationships with several engravers, engravers and also the people that printed and published these things. And it was a whole um, aspect. I mean, you could make a whole separate film about just that. So I think he would have been absolutely delighted that the work could be not only reproduced as accurately as it now can, but disseminated so widely. Um, I mean, I think he would have been absolutely blown away by his fame and um, longevity, actually. Mm. Well, and I think your film, Mike, is actually going to bring, for a lot of people, a kind of new, a feeling of a, a new and closer and sort of more intimate relationship with Turner's work. And I'm sure he couldn't possibly, whatever he would have thought of the film, couldn't possibly have disagreed with that. Well, we haven't been, we're tempted to go down to St Paul's Cathedral and see whether he's turning in his grave or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out. I'm sure he's Thank you very much for your questions. But most thank of all, you. Mike Lee, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.